Well, how come they're getting extra credit? I didn't get extra credit, right? You all got extra credit, right? You're all dear. All right, so... I said, man, what a liar, huh? Um... As you've seen, the exams are not ready. I just this morning got the exams handed back to me by the TAs. I've got a day. There's no way I'm going to get the grades recorded today, so they're not going to be available until Monday. I'm very sorry. I, I wanted to have them by today for you, and for whatever reason, we were unable to do that. So they will be available in the Biochem office uh, for pickup on Monday morning. Uh, you'll need to have your ID uh, to get your um, exam, and that room is ALS 2011. I will post a key on Monday morning that you can see uh, at that time as well. And if you have any questions or whatever, let me know. Okay? All right. So um, I'm going to finish up with a very brief thing uh, talking about one uh, class of enzymes known as kinases, um, specifically nucleoside monophosphate kinases. And then uh, I'm going to turn to another topic that's very important for enzymes, and this topic is that of um, allosteric uh, control of enzymes. So I hope I've planted the idea in your head so far that enzymes are incredibly powerful because they work incredibly fast. But as I said, if, you drive a, if everybody's driving a Ferrari to the grocery store, there's going to be some crashes, there's going to be some problems. And so we want to be able to, uh, or we need to be able to control these enzymes as well. So that'll be the next topic we'll be talking about, which is actually regulation of enzymes. So that's important to keep in mind. This topic I'm going to talk about here today is sort of loosely related to mechanism, uh, but it's not so much mechanism as it is an interesting way of controlling a reaction. And I'll show you uh, that. So nucleoside monophosphate kinases, or what are also called NMP kinases, whenever you see the name kinase, that should immediately tell you something. Kinase means puts phosphate onto. A kinase puts phosphate onto something. So a nucleoside monophosphate kinase is an enzyme that puts a phosphate onto a nucleoside monophosphate. Duh, right? What's a nucleoside monophosphate? Well, everybody's heard of ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate. AMP is a monophosphate, adenosine monophosphate. So an NMP kinase will put a phosphate onto a nucleoside monophosphate like AMP. And when it does, it converts AMP to a diphosphate, making ADP, which you've also heard of. It'll do the same thing with GMP, guanosine monophosphate, and make it GDP. Okay? S cytosine monophosphate makes it uh, CDP. Okay? You have a variety of these. Well, the reactions that they catalyze uh, are basically what you see on the screen here. To transfer a phosphate onto these, we have to have an energy source and we have to have a phosphate source. And the energy source and phosphate source are the same thing. In this case, they're uh, ATP. ATP in this uh, reaction provides energy for moving the phosphate over to the other uh, molecule and it provides the phosphate itself. So we see the reaction that's being catalyzed and going from top down to bottom. That is, we are moving one of the phosphates from ATP over to, uh, in this case, a nucleoside monophosphate to make a nucleoside diphosphate. That could be AMP going to ADP, GMP going to GDP, etc. Okay, well that's what's going on. It turns out that during that transfer, that phosphate is kind of in a limbo. That limbo would allow it, in many cases, to float, float, to float freely. Okay, would allow it to float freely. Okay, try saying that fast three times. Float freely, float freely, float freely. Float. You can't do it, right? I can't even say it once. All right, so. The enzyme has an interesting mechanism that prevents that phosphate from escaping and in fact gets onto the target, which in this case is AMP or NMP. Okay? How does it do it? Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the enzyme. And um, here's a couple of examples of enzymes. Um, here's an adenylate kinase. This is one that makes AMP into ADP. Guanylate kinase makes GMP into GDP. So these are classes of enzymes. And one of the things that we see with these guys is that the... the you know, I, I really don't want to come in each time and then just um, change the battery because I'm hoping I don't throw away a perfectly good battery. But 
it appears that there's nobody who ever uses this, whoever actually does this. You guys can just call me Saint Kevin. Just your holiness. Alright. Now, back to where I was. When we look at the structure of these ends, and this is one place where structure actually tells us a little bit, the reaction is catalyzed in the sort of bowels of the enzyme down in here. And it's in this bowel of the enzyme where the phosphate is moving from the triphosphate over to the monophosphate to make the diphosphate. This enzyme is a really good example of an enzyme whose flexibility, whose structure changes upon binding the substrate. Because this guy comes down with a lid. You can actually see the lid right there. When it binds to the substrate, it closes the lid. And closing the lid keeps water out of there so the phosphate can't get away. Okay? So this is a mechanism that's a physical mechanism that this enzyme is using to sequester that phosphate and make sure it ends up where it needs to be. If that lid can't close, the efficiency of that transfer of that phosphate onto the nucleoside monophosphate to make the diphosphate is very low. That efficiency is very, very low. Okay? So it's important that this lid functions. Now, we will see other examples uh, later in the, in the term of strategies that enzymes use, or strategies of structures of enzymes, to control a reaction going the way that the enzyme wants it to go. Okay? This is the first one that you'll see. So this lid that this NMP kinase uses is a strategy, it's a structural strategy, to make sure that the reaction goes the way that the enzyme wants it to go. Without that lid, it won't do that. Make sense? Clear as mud? Okay. Let's see. Um, what else do I want to say here? I think it's enough. Let's move on to the next material. Okay. So like I said, most of what I'm going to say today actually relates to uh, what's known as uh, regulation. And when we look at regulation, we're going to see regulation occurs at several levels uh, inside of uh, cells. So understanding regu excuse me, regulation is very important. All right, well, how do I want to, I want to control an enzyme. How do I, what, what are the strategies that a cell has for controlling an enzyme? The strategies, excuse me, are, are actually built into the um, structure of the enzyme. The first one I'm going to talk about is one I've mentioned briefly already, and that's called allosterism. And I'll remind you the definition of allosterism is that when a small molecule binds to a protein and affects that protein's activity, that's allosterism. What does that mean from a structural point of view? From a structural point of view, it means that the enzyme must have a binding site for this small molecule. And this binding site, when it's bound by this small molecule, must cause the enzyme to change in structure in some way so that the activity of the enzyme is affected. So allosterism means that the enzyme has to have a structure for binding this small molecule. And if the binding of this small molecule causes the enzyme's activity to be affected, well, think about it. How are we going to affect activity? We're going to change the shape slightly. Very slight changes, not unlike we saw with um, um, hemoglobin binding oxygen, not unlike we're going to see uh, in this uh, example I'm going to show you here. Cells are smart. Now they're not smart in that they sit around and think about things, but they have um, a, an, a, an organization that is phenomenal in terms of being able to control things. And I'm going to show you how efficient cells are um, at being able to do this. The enzyme I'm going to talk about as the first example of regulation, uh, and specifically allosteric regulation, is an enzyme known as ATCase. Um, I get asked, can you use abbreviations answering my exam questions? The answer is yes, but you must have the, if you use an abbreviation, you must have it exactly right. So if you call this guy ACTase, we will count it wrong. So make sure that you get ATCase. ACTase is a very common misspelling of this enzyme. Okay. ATCase is an enzyme that is very important for making nucleotides. Okay? 
Now this is a schematic representation of what ATCase catalyze. ATCase, if you want the real name, stands for aspartate transcarbamylase. That's kind of a mouthful, which is why people call it ATCase. And no, I won't spell that out. It's in your book if you need to, if you want, if you really want to see the name. All right. The reaction that this enzyme catalyzes is shown up here. The names of the molecules aren't even important. Okay? It's making an intermediate that is used to make nucleotides. It's used to make pyrimidine nucleotides. When we think of pyrimidines, we're thinking of C, cytosine, T, thymine, and U, uracil. That's the three pyrimidine nucleotides. So this reaction, it turns out, is the very first step in the synthesis of pyrimidine nucleotides. We're starting to talk about metabolism. This is the very first step. We'll talk in more depth about the synthesis of these nucleotides next term. But I'll just summarize briefly and say this is the first step of 10 that it takes to make a pyrimidine nucleotide. The very first step. Okay. That's what's shown schematically here by these three arrows. There actually should be ten of those arrows, one for each uh, step of the reaction. Okay. ATCase is a classic allosterically regulated enzyme. Okay. Now let's think about the scheme of this. I've got a reaction pathway that has ten steps. And cells have to make nucleotides sometimes, other times they don't have to make nucleotides. Sometimes they want to make nucleotides, sometimes they don't want to make nucleotides. I'll give you a real good example. When a cell doesn't want to make nucleotides is when it has low energy. When the cell is running out of energy, it doesn't make sense to make nucleotides because the cell is trying to conserve energy. The cell doesn't have much energy, it's not going to be dividing, which is the other reason it needs nucleotides to replicate its DNA. So it's going to conserve that. Okay? That's one time a cell wouldn't want to make nucleotides. Another time a cell might not want to make nucleotides if it has too many. Right? Whoa, man, the factory's running overboard. Right? We've made too many cars and they're not moving off the lots. We better slow down the factory. We've got to slow that down. Now, we look at this step right here, and we imagine that, I always use the analogy of General Motors, which maybe I should stop doing that because they're not doing so well, okay? But this car manufacturers are the best, ones I, best analogies I can think of, okay? If I'm General Motors and, this, and, and to make a car at General Motors, it has to, the materials have to pass from one factory to the other factory to the other factory to the other factory, there's going to be a lot of energy that's going to be involved in making a single car. And you know that's the case. There is a lot of energy it takes to make a single car. There's a lot of energy it takes to make a single CTP. Does it make sense for us to run the factory all the way up or make the car all the way up here and then say at this last factory we're going to stop? It doesn't make a lot of sense. We've wasted a lot of energy along the way. This is where allosteric regulation comes in, in, into play in a very neat way. ATCase, which catalyzes this first reaction, is inhibited by the end product of the pathway, CTP. Now, that means that once we start making too much CTP, it turns off the production of CTP. That's pretty cool. Okay? This type of allosteric control is called feedback regulation. Feedback regulation occurs when the last molecule in a pathway inhibits the very first enzyme in that pathway. Feedback regulation. It's very efficient. Now the cell hasn't wasted all the energy in getting to one, you know, maybe this car is missing every, has everything but the door, right? If it has everything but the door, it's still going to sit there on the lot and it's definitely not going to sell. But if I tell the parts manufacturers, okay, we're not going to need parts, we're not going to need mufflers, we're not going to need all this other stuff, okay, early, then I've saved a lot of money if I'm a company, I've saved a lot of energy if I'm a cell. Okay? Make sense? That's how I turn the enzyme off. Turns out I can turn this enzyme on also. Okay? I can turn this enzyme on also.
One of the ways I can turn this enzyme on is also done by allosteric control. This enzyme is very interesting in its allosteric controls. This enzyme can be activated by another molecule. We'll discover it can actually be activated by two different molecules, but one I'm going to talk about right now. Let's think about this. I've got to make DNA, and this pathway leads to making CTP, DCTP, UTP, DTTP, things that go into DNA and RNA, right? If I have C and T, what do I need? A and G, right? What cells have to have is balance. If they have too much of one nucleotide versus the other, it turns out they do something that we really don't like, and that's something we really don't like is they mutate. Cells have the most elaborate controls over the levels of nucleotides of anything that they have in the cell. You'll see this next term when I talk about, this is just scratching the surface of the regulation. This is one tiny piece of it. They go to elaborate controls to make sure they don't have too much of any one nucleotide without balancing it. Because if they don't balance it, then they're going to mutate. When they mutate, you can make cancer, you kill the organism. Not exactly a good career move. Okay? Now, what would be a really good molecule to tell the cell that something's out of balance? Another nucleotide. What nucleotide would be a really good nucleotide to tell the cell we've got too much of something and we need more of the pyrimidines? A purine. And it turns out that ATP activates this enzyme. ATP is a purine. ATP is going to pair with pyrimidine. So now we have a way of balancing. If we get too much ATP, it turns the enzyme on. If we get too much CTP, it turns the enzyme off. This balance is maintained. So these allosteric controls can play very, very important roles, not only in making sure the, end, the, the cell is efficient in its energy use, but also in balancing the amount of nucleotides that it uses uh, to make DNA. And it's doing it to keep the, the cell from mutating, a very cool thing. Okay, more than you wanted to know there probably. Let's see. There's the actual names of the intermediates. You don't need to know the names. Okay. The end product of all this, after 10 steps, not three, is CTP. And that's what CTP looks like. Okay. And you make UTP along the way. And we make TTP in a, in a related way that I won't talk about here. What we discovered, though, is that um, if we take an enzyme and we plot, let's say, KCAT, Okay, for the enzyme, which is essentially what the rate of that formation is. That's the rate of the formation of product. And we measure that as a function of concentration of CTP. We discover the more CTP we put into there, the more the reaction rate falls. This is consistent with what I told you before. I said that CTP inhibits the enzyme, but you probably thought about CTP inhibiting the enzyme in a different way than it actually occurs you probably thought of this as an on-off switch. That's the way we think about things. When I say something is turned off, you think about a light being turned off, and it goes dark. The reality is it's more like a dimmer switch. The light gets turned down. Most biological controls are not absolute on and off. Certainly the allosteric ones are not. The enzyme is less active in the presence of CTP than it is in the absence of CTP. So I want you to keep that in mind. You're probably always going to think about it as an on-off switch, but it really is much more like a dimmer switch that gets turned down or turned way bright. Okay? Okay. Yes, uh, Cassandra. If something is binding and it's changing the shape of the enzyme, how could it yes. not just be turned completely off? Her question is, if something is binding and changing the shape of the enzyme, how could it not be completely turned off? It's a very good question. Let me answer that with a hemoglobin analogy. When we thought about hemoglobin, we thought of hemoglobin existing in the R state and the T state. And in the R state, we said it had high affinity for oxygen. And in the T state, we said it had low affinity for oxygen. I didn't say it was completely bound with oxygen and was completely let go of oxygen, but that it had a lower affinity for oxygen in the T state than it did in the R state. Okay? And that's the answer to your question. The enzyme does the same thing. The, the, the shape change is slight enough that it's not completely whacking out the enzyme but that it's allowing the enzyme to function at a low level. And we'll see this happen over and over with allosteric control. But good thought. Yes, sir? What is CTP 
What is CTP used for? It's used to make RNA. You have to have ATP, CTP, GTP, and UTP to make RNA. And for the life of a cell, they actually need to have that more frequently than they need to have the deoxyribonucleotides because they have to almost constantly be making RNA so they can make messenger RNA so they can make proteins. Okay? Other questions? Okay. Let's see. How... I'm drawing a blank here. I'm feeling kind of like the guy in the that got fired from the orange juice factory. You knew about that, right? You didn't know about the guy at the orange juice factory, why he got fired? Couldn't concentrate. <laughs> okay, that's as good. I told you I was going to be bad the rest of the term for jokes, okay? I told you I would set it up too, right? That, that was my pun. That was my pun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you've heard all my good jokes. I don't have any more good jokes. I'm sorry. All right. Now, this enzyme is a very interesting enzyme. If you remember what I showed you on the thing earlier where I said you didn't need to know those names, but if you remember one of those names, you'll notice that one of the substrates for that enzyme was aspartate. And when we look at, the again, the KCAT, that is the rate with which this enzyme is working, and we look at that as a function of aspartate concentration. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say KCAT. This is velocity. I'm sorry. And this, and this axis is actually velocity. Okay. So if we look at velocity compared to concentration of the substrate, look at what happens. Where have we seen that shape of a curve before? We saw it when we had cooperativity. Okay? And I told you that cooperativity mimics allosteric control. Whenever we see that sigmoid binding curve like that, it tells us that we have allosteric control. This tells us that aspartate is an allosteric effector of this enzyme. An effector. People say, what's an effector? Effector is just something that affects. Okay? It's an allosteric effector of the enzyme, and it's a positive one. As aspartate starts accumulating, the enzyme gets more and more active. And as aspartate concentration is low, the enzyme basically slows way down. I started to say shuts off. Okay? It slows way down. Does this make any sense from an energy perspective? Let's think about this. The cell has got to make decisions. I told you that the cell had to make decisions about when to divide. It doesn't want to divide if it doesn't have a lot of energy. It doesn't want to divide if it doesn't have a lot of resources that it needs to divide. Making proteins, making lipids, making sugars, making all of these things. What is aspartate? It's an amino acid. This amino acid concentration is high. It's one way of measuring the health of the cell. The more aspartate, the more ready this enzyme is to go and party. Okay? The more aspartate, the more, en the more the enzyme is active. And it makes sense. The more amino acids, the more resources that this cell has, the more it wants to prepare to divide. And to prepare to divide, it has to make nucleotides. Okay? Aspartate is a positive regulator, it's a positive allosteric effector of ATCAs. So now we've seen three things. We've seen that CTP is an allosteric inhibitor. We've seen that ATP, and I haven't shown you the, the numbers, but I'll show you the graphs, but I'll show you. ATP is an allosteric activator. And now you see aspartate is an allosteric activator. Okay. Let's take a look now at the uh, structure of uh, ATCAs. ATCAs turns out to be an interesting um, enzyme. Okay? It has 12 subunits, 6 regulatory subunits, and 6 catalytic subunits. We haven't talked about those before. Yes, sir? Um, in the previous slide, yes. No, positive allosteric effectors will will activate the enzyme. Yeah. Did I say did I say slow down? Did I say slow down? Maybe I did. I, I talked about um, um, CTP slowing the enzyme down, but it's a negative allosteric effector. Okay. 
The others are positive allosteric factors. So if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. Okay. So here's what ATCA looks like. Okay, there's its ribbon structure, there's a schematic. It has six catalytic subunits, and what you're looking at is from the top down. You see the three on top, and if you look from the side, you can see there's two of the three there. So there's a top and a bottom, each of which have a catalytic trimer. And it has six regulatory, uh, six regulatory subunits that you can see here. Okay? Now, this enzyme is interesting in that it exists in a couple of different states. And guess what? We call them R and T. Okay? Just like we talked about hemoglobin being in the R state, which was the more relaxed form and was the form that was able to bind oxygen more readily, the R form of an enzyme is the more active form of the enzyme. Because it the R form of the enzyme is the more active form of the enzyme. It's the more relaxed form of the enzyme. And I'll show you a better figure in a minute about that. The T state of the enzyme is the tight form. It's the uptight one. It's not flexible. It's not nearly as active. It is active. It's just not nearly as active. Okay. Now I want you to keep this picture in your mind about separate regulatory and catalytic subunits. The catalytic subunits are the places where the reaction is catalyzed. That's why they're called the catalytic subunits. The regulatory subunits play a role in regulating the enzyme. Okay, now let's take a look at what happens here. Okay, uh, before I do that, I better set this up. Okay. ATCA, and this is, uh, I want to be careful here, because students frequently get something I'm getting ready to tell you confused, and I want you to be the first class that has no confusion about this. Okay? Scientists study enzymes using inhibitors, right? We've studied inhibitors, we've talked about inhibitors before, we talked about competitive inhibitors, we talked about non competitive inhibitors, right? Everybody remembers that, I hope. Okay? So one of the ways to study enzymes is with inhibitors. I'm getting ready to ta tell you about an inhibitor. This inhibitor is a man made molecule. An MMM, okay? Man made molecule. It's not a normal substrate. It is, in fact, a, it, it behaves rather like a competitive inhibitor. You're going to see it's not a competitive inhibitor, and I'll show you why, okay? But it's a man made molecule, and it's called PALA, P A L A. PALA is something we use to study this enzyme, it is not something that the, that the body has. There's no PALA in your body, unless you happen to accidentally swallow some while you're doing the experiment. In which case, you might be in rather deep doo-doo. Okay, so, PALA looks like the normal substrate. It resembles a normal substrate. But when the enzyme binds to PALA, it becomes covalently attached to the enzyme. What does that tell us? Suicide inhibitor. It's a suicide inhibitor of the enzyme. Okay? Now, when the enzyme binds PALA, something very interesting and something weird happens with this enzyme. Okay? The something interesting and the something weird, that's not it, is actually here. Here are the two states of the enzyme, the T state and the R state. Look at what PALA is doing. It's binding to the enzyme and it's locking it in the R state. Holy moly. What do you think about that? Is that? Does that make sense to you? No? At least one person says is honest and says no. It doesn't make any sense, right? How does this inhibit the enzyme if it does that? By the fact that it's a suicide inhibitor. R and T are just two different structures that it can exist in. This PALA binding to the enzyme and causing the enzyme to flip into the R state is exactly what you would expect to happen based on what I've already told you. Now you've got to think about that. What did he tell us that would convince us that this should have happened? Anybody? Yes, Lori? It binds just like a normal substrate would, so the enzyme undergoes the structural changes it would if it was the normal substrate. And the normal substrate was? Aspartate. When I put aspartate, which is the normal substrate in there, what happened to the enzyme? Its activity went up. Aspartate was flipping it into the R state. Right? The only difference here is that Palo, once it binds, the enzyme's in the R state, but it's just stuck there. It's got no other place to go. 
So knowing that the normal substrate would flip it into the R state should convince us that binding poly flipping it in the R state makes perfect sense. Everybody understand that? I see a lot of nods. That's good. For a Friday, that's really good. Okay? Okay? Now, it was actually because of Paula that people really began to understand what R states and T states actually are. Because it turns out this enzyme, in its normal activity, flips between R state and T state all on its own. All on its own. It can flip from T to R and R to T. It turns out that if we don't have anything else there, about 99.9% .9 of the time it exists in the T state. The only way we discovered it was in the R state was when we actually locked it into the R state and it couldn't flip back out. That was kind of cool. Okay? That was kind of cool. So now let's think about this. This, yes, uh, Megan. Okay, so our question is, doesn't it increase the affinity of the next one to bind more aspartate? In fact, it does. Uh, since you've asked the question, let me just give you a, a cool example. It's actually one of the problems I have in the book. Okay? It's something I used to ask on the exam. Maybe I'll ask it this year, you never know. The question is this. A scientist is studying ATCAs and discovers that if they add the suicide inhibitor PALA to their reaction, it kills the enzyme. They discover if they add just a little bit of PALA to the enzyme, it actually activates it. How do you suppose that happens? Do you know? So keep in mind you have six subunits. If you add just a little bit, you get one of the subunits, you lock the enzyme in the R state, the other subunits don't have PALA, they can catalyze like crazy. Kind of cool. Okay? Now, this tells us, actually, that in fact this enzyme does flip between R and T on its own. This is different from what we saw with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, we, t we talked about a sequential model. Binding the first oxygen caused the second oxygen to bind differently, caused the third one to bind differently, caused the fourth one to bind differently, right? Here, the enzyme is flipping on its own between R and T, and the enzyme is getting locked into a configuration based on what is bound to it. Many of you asked last time, I don't understand the concerted model. When I talked about the concerted model, I said it flips on its own independently. This is a concerted model. The flipping is occurring. It's not being caused by the substrate. It is actually being locked in place once the substrate is bound to it. So if, if the substrate happens to be in the R state when the substrate binds, which is much more likely, it's going to lock it in that R state. Make sense? Okay. Now, my next question, if I were, if I were making up an exam today, I'm telling you guys all my good questions here. All right? If I were making up an exam today, I'd say, where on the enzyme does Paula bind? Which subunit? I hear catalytic. Anybody for regulatory? No brave souls for regulatory? You're not going to be sucked into that one today, is that right? Okay. Yeah, it's catalytic because that's where the substrate would bind. You guys are a good class. Most classes will actually get sucked into that because when they hear the word regulatory, they always oh, got to be binding the regulatory site. In fact, Pala is binding the catalytic subunit because, yeah, that's where the normal substrate binds. This looks like the normal substrate. It's binding at the catalytic subunit. It's locking it in that configuration. Okay? Look at this difference in configuration. The R state is, it is more relaxed. It is more open. And if we're trying to get substrate into the bowels of this enzyme, it's much easier to get them in here than it is to get it in over here. This enzyme on the right is going to be, if in fact there are active subunits that aren't bound with PALA, this enzyme on the right in the R state is going to be much more active than one in the T state, as shown on the left. Okay. Well, that takes care of um, the um, aspartate and takes care of PALA, all right? And that's just some more blah, blah, blah. We won't worry about that, all right? But what about CTP? Well, it turns out CTP favors, not surprisingly, the T-state. And not surprisingly, CTP binds to the regulatory subunits. That's one of the reasons they're called the regulatory subunits. Binding of, CT, excuse me, binding of CTP to the regulatory subunits 
stabilizes the T-structure. This is how that enzyme is turned off. I'll let you tell me where you think ATP is going to bind. Regulatory, absolutely. Okay. How do I know it was regulatory? Well, I guess I know a little bit more about that reaction, but if you look back on the reaction, you don't see any catalytic site for ATP. That is, there's no ATP doesn't play a role in the catalysis. So it must not be binding at the active site, it must be binding somewhere else. The most logical place for it to bind is in fact the regulatory subunit. When ATP binds to the regulatory subunit, what do you suppose it does? Flips it into the R state, not flips it, it holds it in the R state. Okay, now if I were to ask you on an exam the difference between the sequential model and the concerted model, do you think you'd be able to tell me in words? Okay, keep that in mind. I think it's important to be able to describe those. Yes? Uh, is it just in the considered model, is it just like a random flipping or are there certain factors that will make it? Flip? So her question is if, uh, when we talk about the concerted model, is it a random flipping or are there factors that can flip it? And for the most part, as long as we don't have any unusual things in the system, the flipping is random. And as I said, if we don't have anything else there, 99.9% .9 of the time it'll exist in the T. We wouldn't even know it existed in an R state unless we locked it in the R state. And that's what gave us the clue to what was going on with that. Okay? So the concerted model says that the flipping is not caused by anything. It's a random thing. But that binding of certain molecules will, will lock it into one versus the other state. Binding of CTP to the regulatory subunit will lock it in the T state. <coughs> binding, of, <coughs> excuse me, binding of ATP to the regulatory site will bind in the lock it in the R state, and binding of aspartate to the catalytic subunit will lock it in the R state as well. Okay? Yes, Jenny? Are ATP and CTP competing for the same binding site? Good question. She asked if ATP and CTP are, binding, uh, are competing for the same binding site, and to some extent they do overlap, yes. So the, so the question is relevant when we think about which one wins. If they're both trying to bind to the same site, which one wins? The one that's going to win most of the time is the one that's in the highest concentration. And again, this is a beautiful way of balancing. The more ATP we get, the more likely it wins. The more CTP we get, the more likely CTP wins. Very cool. Yes? Well, you already kind of said this, but they don't influence the flipping. They just simply lock it in one state versus the other. That's right. Yes, one more. So if you have like three subunits with ATP and three subunits that have bound CTP, what's happening with the R and T states? So our question is if you had three subunits that bound ATP and three subunits that bound CTP, what happens to the R and the T states? Um, let me think about this. That's a good question. Let me make a good exam question out of that. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks a lot, right? <laughs> No. Um, it would be unlikely. It would be unlikely because I think what would happen uh, would be the first one that bound would lock it in whatever state it happened to be in at that time. And so that even though more bound, because we don't see a flipping that happens as a result of binding, that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be able to change as a result of that. So I, I think that's what would happen. But it's a very good question. When I don't know, then you've asked a good question. Or I'm just stupid. You know, can't rule that out. Okay. I heard some applause for that. <laughs> He's stupid. <laughs> okay. Uh, R state, T state. Okay. More active, less active, blah, blah, blah. They don't show ATP on there, but ATP also plays a role. Um, not surprisingly, if you look at velocity, you measure that velocity as a function of a sparsate concentration. If you compare it when CTP is present versus absent, guess what? It's lower in CTP. I've already shown you that. Okay. Not a surprise. I put ATP in there. Not surprisingly, its activity increases. Okay, not a surprise. Here's the concerted model, and all this, these numbers. Don't worry about these numbers. Is L? L is simply the ratio of the um, R to T. I'm sorry, the T to R. So in the case of CTP, the ratio of, of T to R is over a thousand to one. In the presence of ATP, it's only 70 to 1. So you reduce that ratio of T by a considerable amount by adding ATP. 
The sequential model is what we talked about relative to uh, hemoglobin. I'll remind you of that. One causes the other, causes the other, causes the other to flip. That's not what's happening with ATCAs. Okay? And that's what I want to say there. Now, I've got one more topic, and then we'll have a little fun. Okay. So, um, another model of regulation of enzymes um, is um, that of um, uh, this enzyme called protein kinase A. You're going to hear a lot for the rest of the term about protein kinase A. First of all, what reaction does this enzyme catalyze? Addition of a phosphate to protein. So this guy catalyzes the transfer of phosphate onto proteins. To put a phosphate onto proteins, you have to have hydroxyl groups. Three amino acids have side chains with hydroxyl groups. threonine, serine, tyrosine. These are the three targets, and enzymes tend to be specific for one of those. Protein kinase A is one class of enzyme, and it actually puts them onto serine and threonine. Protein kinase A is, is regulated allosterically in an interesting way, and this allosteric regula regulation is pretty much an on or an off. It's one of the few allosteric regulations that we see as an on or an off. Okay? And the way it works as an, on, as, an off, as an on or an off is different from the way that ATCase is regulated. Cyclic AMP, abbreviated CAMP, as you see here, cyclic AMP is a molecule that we're going to hear a lot more about. It's not AMP, it's cyclic AMP. It has another ring structure in it compared to AMP. Cyclic AMP we're going to see is a molecule involved in signaling in cells. Cells have to talk to each other. Cells have to talk inside of themselves. And inside of themselves, the mechanism by which many of them talk is cyclic AMP. So we'll talk about that in a bit. How is protein kinase A regulated by cyclic AMP? That's shown here. Protein kinase A has four subunits. Two regulatory and two catalytic subunits. In the situation shown on the left, the regulatory subunits are bound to the catalytic subunits and they cover up the active site. This enzyme on the left is dead in the water. It's not only low, there's nothing going on. Because this enzyme has its active site covered up and it cannot do anything. This is one way of completely turning off an enzyme. When the cell starts to send a signal, it makes cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits, causing a structural change. And that structural change releases the catalytic subunits. Okay? The catalytic, I'm sorry, the, 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 the binding of the um, uh, cyclic AMP to the regulatory subunits releases the catalytic subunits. And these guys now have active sites that can bind to hydroxyl groups on proteins, put phosphates on them. And you're thinking, whoop de doo, right? Well, putting phosphates onto, protein, uh, onto proteins, you're going to discover is one of the major control mechanisms that exist inside of cells. Why do you suppose that that would have a big effect on cells? Why would putting phosphates onto proteins, what would it do? It's going to change the structure. Why is it going to change the structure? Phosphates negatively charged. You're going to change that environment. That's the enzyme. That that protein that it goes onto is going to change shape. And again, you've seen over and over, changing shape changes function. This is an example. Putting phosphate onto something is an example of yet another type of regulation. It's called covalent modification. So if I put a phosphate onto something, I'm covalently modifying what I'm putting it onto. So protein kinase A is an enzyme whose action causes covalent modification. Protein kinase A is an enzyme whose action causes covalent modification. We're going to see covalent modification as one of four ways of controlling enzymes. Actually, three ways, but they're sort of a subgroup, okay? Notice that protein kinase A itself is allosterically regulated. 
It's allosterically regulated by cyclic AMP. Okay. Questions on that? Clear as mud? Yes? So is there like some part of the enzyme that's maybe behind this picture holding everything together so the active sites don't float off? Question is, is there something behind this enzyme holding this together so that the, 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 the guys don't uh, fly off? And the answer is no. But you'll find that the, the, the uh, bouncing into each other inside the confines of the cell happens so readily that this can readily be turned off by this mechanism once the cyclic AMP gets broken down. And I'll talk about that later. Okay? You guys up for a song or two? Yeah. Okay. Actually, have, uh, I felt bad that you didn't have the exams, so I actually decided to punish you with two songs. The first one, how many people know the song Danny Boy? Oh, Danny Boy. Da, 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 da. All right. This is about a topic we actually covered a while back, but I didn't sing the song because we were busy. And it's called O Delta G. You can join me with this. O Delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy can tell us if a process will advance. Cause if the values less than naught, it translates that reverse reactions haven't got a chance. But when the sign is plus, it is the opposite. And then the backwards happens all the time. It's going to get worse. A factor is the standard gives free energy. So don't forget about the delta G naught prime. Okay. We're not done. We're not done. Okay, this is just sort of a good, maybe, I hope this, is, this isn't too negative of a message. Just, anybody know the song, This Land is Your Land? This land is your land, this land is my land, from New York. Okay, it's called, this song's for BB450. It's 12 o'clock and Ahern's talking, Henderson and Hasselbach and PKAs and buffers I should know. This song's for BB450. I hope that maybe he'll think the way we wrote our answers wasn't crazy. I really need the partial credit, so this song's for BB450. It's really groovy that it improves me watching lectures and quick time movies. I really need to go and download those podcasts for BB450. I'm feeling manic. I'm in a panic. I better study my old organic. It has reactions that I need to know. This song's for BB450. I heard he said it and now I dread it because I miss Fridays. Extra credit will probably haunt me that lowly zero grade and BB450. It could be steric or esoteric. The carbons get so anomeric. I'm too hysteric. Better let it go. This song's for BB450. Okay, that's it. It gets locked in it. And so if you take something and you say, okay, now I, I lock you in the R state, everything else is still going randomly. Another one comes along, it gets locked in the R state. So, the, so think about it happening one one hundredth of the time. Right. Okay? So one one hundredth of the time, it's in, it's, it's in the R state. All right? Right. So one one hundredth of the time, it gets locked there. And now another one 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 hundredth of the time, it gets locked there. Eventually, they all get locked there. Or a good, a good percentage of them get locked. 
don't you have to have a high enough concentration of whatever's locking it there that if it flips, that's why you have lock it? aspartate and ATP in high concentration they do that okay so you do have to have a high enough concentration then. but that's the point yeah I mean without the high concentration they wouldn't do it okay right right What's that? Your definition of, of allosteric? Allosteric is when a small molecule binds to a large molecule and affects its activity. Okay, because the previous classes I've, I've, I've been told an extra, extra little point that it doesn't bind in the active site. And so when you call There are some that do and some that don't. Right, when you it, called aspartate a yeah. allosteric yeah. Some do and some don't. Sector. It's subject, so it's binding the active site. It is binding the active site. Okay. Yeah. So it can, it can be either way. But most of, most of them do not bind the active site. And why?